Welcome to Arts Express. This is Prairie Miller, and on the show, Liquor Mania. It is time to keep your appointment with the Wicker Man. A couple of years ago, thanks to the kindness of strangers, an old lady sent me six sacks of letters, storyboards, scripts, an uncut LP of The Wicker Man that had been literally sitting in her attic for 50 years. And so we've gone on this journey to try and find out, well, A, why is this film so so extraordinarily impactful? Also, what role really did our father have to play? Um, you know, yes, he was the director. Yes, he was the auteur. You know, so so they say. But actually, you know, what was really going on? And the papers, I'm afraid, really get to tell us something that hasn't really been told in the 50 years. That is the extraordinary thing about these papers. Justin says it's the un- never before seen, never before understood inside view of the making of this independent film. And, uh, you know, it's been an amazing year for us. We've been up to uh, Newton Stewart up in Scotland where the film was made. We've been down in, in Leicester Square. Film simply will not go away. And what you just heard were the sons of Robin Hardy Justin and Dominic investigating in their upcoming film, Wicker Mania, the still unsolved cultural and historical mysteries of their father's cult classic, The Wicker Man, on this, the 50th anniversary of the political horror movie's release. Brett Gregory at our UK desk interrogates Wicker Mania's producer, Chris Nunn, as to what's in store, why now 50 years later, and much more. The Wicker Man, starring Edward Woodward, Christopher Lee and Britt Eklund, was released in 1973. It was directed by Robin Hardy, written by Anthony Schaffer and produced by Peter Snell. A seemingly simple story about a police officer searching for a missing schoolgirl on a remote island off the coast of Scotland, it is one of the most important films in the history of British cinema. A mystical, multi-layered microcosm of Britishness itself its past, its present, and its people, its conservatism, its paganism, and its radicalism, its habits, its hopes, and its horrors. My name's Brett Gregory, and here at the UK desk for Arts Express, we have a very special guest with us this evening, who is currently working on a project which, incredibly, is about to add another layer of meaning to this stone-cold classic film. Another perspective, and another dimension. So uh, my name is Chris Nunn. I am Assistant Professor of Film at the University of Birmingham, and I am the producer of an upcoming feature documentary currently called Wicker Mania. It follows uh, two half-brothers who are the sons of the original director of The Wicker Man, Robin Hardy. So we follow Justin and Dominic as they try to understand their father, who they both had a slightly problematic relationship with, through his cult film and actually end up perhaps uh, finding each other instead. That's a totally unique angle. So why now? The 50th anniversary of The Wicker Man is why we started this project. It's taken on its own characteristics and has moved quite organically in the direction that it has. But it's still very much tied to the fact that we're still talking about this film 50 years later. And your role as producer on this particular project, what's your approach? My main duties in that role are quite interesting, really, in this context, because I keep calling myself a sort of creative producer, as opposed to the producer who sort of finds money and schedules everything. I have found some money, which has been mildly useful, but I have not really done schedules and, you know, spreadsheets and other things. It's been much more about having uh, an overview of what the film is, uh, an overview of um, how it might come to fruition, etc., etc. 
and it's still a work in progress at the moment. What's the footage like? The film is working best when the brothers are literally standing where their father stood. Uh, we have some wonderful footage in Scotland of the brothers at the, at the remaining stumps of the Wicker Man and footage of Robin Hardy in the same place, and it resonates. So the production is starting to take its own course. Originally, when we started the project, I would have said that it was targeted at people who are fans of The Wicker Man. Uh, the longer we go on, the more I think it's actually uh, a very personal documentary, uh, an almost therapy film, which is for anyone, really, who has um, a family. Related to that, what's this I hear about family heirlooms being hidden in the attic? We are using some newly discovered original sources, which are papers uh, from Robin Hardy's study during the production of The Wicker Man and the years preceding it and about a year afterwards. So uh, letters, photographs, um, and they tell a very interesting story. They tell the story from Hardy's perspective, which I don't think we've particularly had. Um, Alan Brown's book on The Wicker Man sort of seemed to privilege Anthony Schaffer, the screenwriter's perspective. So it's quite nice, really, to be looking through these documents and going, ah, right. So there were, there were all these people saying Hardy was a terrible director, but what were his experiences? And there are a few letters in there that give us a sort of insight into that. So history is being rewritten. Sounds like there's much more to this, though. From my best understanding, unfortunately, when The Wicker Man bombed at the box office, Robin Hardy left his family, uh, which is a key moment in our film, and uh, left his then wife, Caroline, Justin's mother, um, with a huge amount of debts uh, in excess, we think, of kind of £600,000 in today's money. So they had to sell their house. They moved. And I think it's the house they moved to is where the materials were just put in the loft and clearly left in the loft and had sat there fairly authentically for about the last 50 years until someone wrote to Justin saying, I found all this stuff, do you want it? Uh, or shall I burn it? <laughs> so, uh, And as Justin recounts, every time we do an interview about this, he very nearly said, well, burn it. I don't want anything to do with this. Uh, and indeed, when you, when you see the film, you will start to understand why. Total drama. You've got to tell us a bit more, Chris. So they... They don't know each other very well as brothers, I guess. They didn't grow up together. Uh, and they've come together to be academics. Again, Justin is, uh, is a lecturer at University College London and Dominic is at the University of Quebec, Montreal, uh, as, a, as a professor of art history. And of course, I'm an academic too. So it's a very, it, it's a very academic-led film, which is appreciating the value of having new primary sources to base a narrative around. Uh, and I suppose the brothers have discovered through those primary sources just what an impact the Wicker Man had on their um, on their family, on Robin Hardy's health, on Robin Hardy's finances, but really by extension on the 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 finances of the Hardy household and and particularly Justin's mother, Caroline. And I would be lying if I said that hasn't been a very painful process uh, for them. Um, that again, I suppose my role on this film is to be as objective as possible, given the subjectivity that arises when the brothers uh, interact with each other and, and get talking. So there are some emotional, very emotional moments um, in the film. Sounds like it. Pretty heavy. So what role is the University of Birmingham playing in all this? Justin and I uh, had worked originally together at the University of Greenwich in London. Uh, and when I uh, moved to the University of Birmingham, there was a sense that we could, as many universities can these days, uh, actually put, pull together a feature doc using the resources that we have, using, you know, whatever kit that, that the university possesses, uh, and indeed whatever talent the university possesses. And this is how we've been able to put this film together on a, a very small amount of money. Uh, again, down the track, we hope to sell it, make some money, and indeed pay all the fabulous people who've, who've worked with us. Is that the end goal, or is there more? The end goal is tricky, really. It's bigger than the film. The film feels like a catalyst for further discussions, part of which is the legacy of The Wicker Man, but part of which is also looking at that kind of independent film-making landscape. You know, kind of appreciating The Wicker Man as a radical text 
Robin Hardy in his cult film here as a radical first time feature director. At the time when The Wicker Man was reviewed in the uh, in 1973, it was really well received by critics saying this is what British film needs to be. And here we are 50 years later, wondering if we need to be having more creative conversations about what British film can be. Moreover, Justin and I have long-term ambitions. We're both uh, academics, we're both in education. Uh, we, we have long-term ambitions to set up some kind of film education, uh, filmmaking education school up in the area where The Wicker Man was shot. Uh, we might call it the cult film school or something, a space for um, young emerging filmmakers who want to come and want to workshop ideas that are going to push boundaries. Uh, that, is, that is what we're really hoping uh, we're able to achieve from this. That's a fantastic idea and essential. This is a uh, sort of low to no budget film. We don't really have any resources. Uh, we did just have a successful Kickstarter, which was fantastic, but we're keeping that money aside to clear archive, particularly Wicker Man footage. So you need investment. But we're more than happy to have conversations for anyone who's who's sort of happy to invest. Uh, noting, of course, here in the UK, particularly at the moment, there is a cost of living crisis. So we don't really expect people to be uh, being able to bankroll uh, 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 quirky documentaries. But if anyone's listening and they are thinking, yes, actually, I could bankroll your quirky documentary, then uh, then we would love to hear from you. You can find us on social media, uh, on Twitter at Wikimania, on Instagram at Wicca underscore mania um, any contact through there will come straight to me and we hope to share this film with you uh, later in the year amazing chris sounds like you're on a proper filmmaking journey it's a fantastic project and it deserves support anyway nice one thanks very much again for having me this has been the uk desk for arts express and i've been Brett gregory i'm interested in exploring and promoting film academia and independent filmmaking in the UK and the US. If you are too, then please feel free to email me at brett at seriousfeather.com or search for Serious Feather on social media. Cheers. Thank you, Brett Gregory. And coming up next on Arts Express, before Judy Dolls, there was Barbie Doll, or rather Barbie knockoff post-World War II German sex doll, Lily, both cut from the same cloth, so to speak, or rather not much of it. Director Susan Stern is on the line to present assorted, under-the-radar revelations in her documentary, Barbie Nation, an unauthorized tour. Stern also shares a look back on her screen memoir of her late legendary underground cartoonist spouse, Spain Rodriguez and that documentary, Bad Attitude. First, a little more about that covert Barbie origin story, then Susan Stern. Back in 1952, a German tabloid called The Bild Zeitung had a blank spot that the editors needed to fill. They called on cartoonist Reinhard Boitin to come up with something. That something turned out to be a comic strip starring a character named Lily. Lily was a saucy secretary who moonlighted as an escort. Described as a post-war, gold-digging buxom broad who got by in life seducing wealthy male suitors, Lily received all sorts of expensive gifts from her sugar daddies, which she loved to show off in the cartoons. The gifts, not the uh, sugar daddies. She wasn't exactly the kind of character you'd imagine becoming the most recognizable children's doll in history. Lily became so popular that the decision was made to market her as a three-dimensional doll. Originally, the built Lily dolls, as they were known, they were explicitly considered adult novelties and targeted at men who purchased them from places like bars, tobacco shops, and adult toy stores. Men got Lily dolls as gag gifts at bachelor parties. The design of the doll closely mirrored Lily's appearance in the comic strip, which included heavy makeup and an extra curvy figure. The doll was targeted for grown men, rather than young girls. But a woman named Ruth Handler saw its potential. Hello, and welcome to our show. Hey, it's great to be here, Prairie. <laughs> okay. Now, Barbie Nation is titled as well, An Unauthorized Tour. Please explain. 
<laughs> when I made Barbie Nation, and one of the things that is in Barbie Nation is the story of Mattel suing or threatening to sue all sorts of people that were doing things with Barbie back in the 90s uh, that are still being done. So that included people who were making satirical dolls out of Barbie and a whole industry that grew up independent of Mattel that was the collectors, and they, they threatened or sued people. So I was, of course, afraid of being sued. Um, I, when I called Mattel initially and said, hey, I want to make this documentary, they said at the time, um, well, we're not going to make a film about Barbie, and neither are you. Mm. Um, so it's really interesting that Mattel has decided to make this film, um, allow Greta Gerwig to make this film. And there's a lot of business things that are playing in here. Um, I can go off on all these digressions. I should stick to your topic. Um, so right up at the time that Barbie Nation came out, I was still afraid they were going to sue me. I had promised to let them know when it was going to air. It was airing on public television. But I waited till after 5 p.m. on the day it was going to air, you know, so they couldn't get an injunction against me. And why did you want to go for an unauthorized rather than officially approved version? Well, first of all, Mattel wouldn't cooperate with me. So there was no question of doing an approved version. As I say, Mattel said to me at the beginning, uh, we're not going to do a film about Barbie. And part of that was, and I can't remember if it was said to me by Ruth Handler herself, the founder of Barbie and founder of Mattel, or by Mattel's PR people, that they felt that if they ever made a live action Barbie film or even a documentary, it would deprive, they said girls, but I think it's boys as well and, and gender non-specific people, of the ability to use Barbie to, to project onto, to dream their dreams through Barbie, the way Ruth put it. So they didn't, they didn't want to go there. Mm. Um, I, their cooperation, I mean, they ultimately cooperated with me, which was really unexpected. Um, I was, I talked to a lawyer. The lawyer said, you can go ahead and you can film people playing Barbie. Uh, Mattel can't do anything to you. So I went ahead. I, I got deeper and deeper into the Barbie world. I went to one of these um, national, large national Barbie doll conventions put on by people who love Barbie. And I met Mattel people there and we hit it off. And the next thing I knew, they were giving me written, they were, they mailed me the old Barbie doll commercials, which are in Barbie Nation, which are amazing, which we intercut with footage from the Times. And they just opened up. Um, I also got by accident an interview with Ruth Handler at a Mattel convention when they, she was only talking to really big media people, but they let me just tag along while she walked down the hallway and then someone canceled their interview and I got an interview and Ruth and I hit it off and she invited me back to her Los Angeles penthouse where I was able to interview not only her and her husband, Elliot Handler, the co-founder of Mattel, but Barbara Siegel, uh, Ruth's daughter. And have there been any unauthorized repercussions since the film was made for you, corporate or otherwise? Um, not yet, and I <laughs> hope not now. I mean, and I say that because Barbie Nation is such a lens to see how the world has changed in the last 25 years. So when I made the film, which has some very... Uh, controversial things in it, which is just the way people play with Barbie. Uh, there was an image. I went to a Barbie art show of people doing art with Barbie. Someone had made, sprayed Barbie gold and nailed her to a cross. And so I filmed that. I didn't have fears 25 years ago, but when I went to cut uh, the trailer for the Barbie Nation director's cut, I put that little shot in, and then I stayed up all night thinking, Somebody's going to come and kill me. Mm. And I didn't think that 25 years ago. Yeah. Uh, now that feels real. And how would you say your own personal growing up Barbie experience shaped or influenced the direction of your film or not? Well, it definitely did because as, you know, one of the great truths that I've come to understand is that there's only two types of people in the world. There's the Barbie glorifiers and the Barbie defilers. Mm -hmm. And once I started hearing those stories, it made me feel better about my own story uh, because I got the first Barbie doll. My parents got it for me when I was six. 
uh, years old, and I immediately cut the ponytail off. Mm. But back in 1959, the hair was only rooted at the very edge of the scalp, mm. so the hair all fell down over her face, and her scalp was completely bald. Mm. Um, but I was a defiler. I was somebody who my first thought was, you know, let's do something I'm not supposed to do. <laughs> And what are your thoughts about Barbie originating from a German sex doll named Lily? Yeah, yeah, that is an amazing part of the Barbie story. And again, I was fortunate. I don't even remember from whom I got an actual Lily doll that is in Barbie Nation. Of course, she was very valuable. Some collector had her and let us take her and film her. So she's in Barbie Nation as well as some of the cartoon uh, she originated as a cartoon character in a, mm. in a German tabloid. I mean, it, it's perfectly fitting. I mean, Barbie is very sexual. Everybody knows that. You know, it's something I think Mattel has to constantly deal with because there's a lot of people out there, and apparently there's even more of them now than 25 years ago, that think children need to not see the human body. And speaking of which, while the film points out that the creation of Barbie was intended to expand the limited life role presented to young girls exclusively handed baby dolls to cultivate the roles as mother as future mothers, yet introducing the problematic issues of their own with Barbie as a sexually objectified, sexualized standard of actually unattainable shape and beauty frustrating most coming-of-age females. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, it... It is true. Uh, Barbie is a ridiculous image, though I have to say, I when I think of Barbie, I also think of the uh, Venus of Willendorf, uh, who's very sexualized. She's thought of not as a doll, but of a, as a fertility image, huge hips, big breasts. So I think humans have really been drawn to these images, these, these um, objects that personify the human body in the human body is very sexual uh, and we've been drawn to that for a long time and so while I understand the feminists and I consider myself a feminist who didn't want their children to have Barbies I understand the ways the doll is problematic I think it's it's the doll is also a great opportunity to talk to our children about media the doll is a piece of media we live in a media-saturated world. We can either choose to try to shelter our children from that, or we can teach our children to be media critics. I think you can start at about the age of two once they start talking. And what can you say about the Barbie uprising challenge that we see in your film to corporate and consumer ownership rights as a related issue in the film? Yeah, that is really interesting because... What's interesting about Barbie, the real reason I made, the reason I made Barbie Nation is just all these people out there that take this, the ultimate of mass-produced things, and they make a life from it for themselves, which is unique. And they, it's this amazing fountain of human creativity. And yeah, I guess the corporate, yeah, I mean, the corporations could see it as a challenge. Mattel once saw it as a challenge. Corporations can see that as a challenge, but not if they're smart. If they're smart, the corporations will see it as an opportunity, um, which has its own problems. But uh, what excites me is that human creativity. That's, that's, you know, with AI taking over, all we're going to have left is our bad hair and our creativity. And this is pretty much what's going on with the beginnings of the Internet, that all sorts of so-called uh, property right items are being taken over publicly and just put out there and no longer are attached to some copyright. Yeah, it's true. It's interesting. As an artist and filmmaker, I, of course, have mixed feelings about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on the one hand, I want my stuff to be uh, acknowledged and uh monetized. On the other hand, you know, and, there, and there's a difference. There's a difference between little independent filmmakers like myself and giant corporations. Mm. You know, I think there are differences there. Whether the courts can recognize those differences, I don't know. 
or even in terms that some of my colleagues have gotten into trouble, even putting, let's say, a Hollywood logo on one of their reviews and, and they get cease and desist orders. <laughs> Well, that I think is totally wrong. I mean, I actually, for Barbie Nation, I, I did do a lot of, I hired lawyers and we did a lot of legal research on the issues of fair use, you know, and, and clearly you can use the logos in your reviews. I mean, that is clearly fair use. I mean, what we're trying to do, and one of the reasons on Barbie Nation, there's a disclaimer at the very beginning, it says this is not authorized by Mattel. You're trying not to try to confuse the public into thinking that, you know, something that you do is really being done by somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if you um, are doing satire, if you're doing a critique, if you're doing journalism, we hope <laughs> the Supreme mm -hmm. Court will keep that protected. Mm -hmm. And are you working on anything next or thinking about something next? Well, I actually have a, I just finished a current film, and it is also streaming on um, pay-per-view for Amazon. Oh. Others, It's called, uh, yes, it's called Bad Attitude, The Art of Spain Rodriguez, and it's about uh, my late husband, who was an underground cartoonist, mm. and it's about the underground comics movement. It also, like um, Barbie Nation, had many things in it that had to be censored to enable it to be on uh, streaming. I noticed that listed for you before Barbie Nation were only films about males. And I'm curious why you switched oh. to making something about females. Female in the sense that Barbie and Ruth yes. Handler are female? Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Well, Barbie Nation was my first film. Um, and that's interesting. I never thought of it that way. Uh, what is true is that I have done films that are in some ways all about my family. Mm. Um, I didn't realize it until re-releasing Barbie Nation that um, my family is in all of my films. Nora uh, was in Barbie Nation. My second film was about my father who chose to take his own life rather than go through uh, the American way of uh, death. Mm. And uh, Bad Attitude, of course, about my late husband and the underground comics movement. So I, I suppose I... After many years as a journalist, I was a print journalist for many years, I ended up making things that were somehow very personal. Mm. And where were you a print journalist? The last, um, well, I was, the last journalism gig was I worked for um, Channel 5 News in San Francisco, the CBS affiliate. Yeah. And before that, I was at the Oakland Trib under Robert Maynard. I was a reporter. Oh, and the film about your father, is that the film called Self-Made Man? Yes, The oh. Self-Made Man is okay. about my father. And, you know, it's about my whole family. So my daughter's in that film as well, uh, as she is also in the film about uh, her father, uh, mm -hmm. Spain Rodriguez. Okay, well, thank you so much, Susan, for calling into our show. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. Okay, bye. Bye. And Barbie Nation. An unauthorized tour is out now in release online. This is Comrade Karl Marx. And when I'm visiting the 21st century, I listen to Arts Express with host Prairie Miller. You have nothing to lose but your chains. You have a world to win. Listeners of the world, unite. That's Arts Express with host Prairie Miller, where art meets politics. And if you're down with the status quo, take the local. And now on Arts Express, I've been out since day one. We hit the ground running after a SAG union official and long-term film and television actress Linda Powell with a strike update taking time off to talk to Arts Express from her Broadway stage performance in A Beautiful Noise. Coincidentally, exactly what she's been doing off stage as well, making noise on all four of the union's picket lines in New York City against those Wall Street-controlled movie corporations. This is Jack Shalom for Arts Express, and I'm very happy to have today as our guest Linda Powell, the first vice president of the New York local board of the sag after Union. <laughs> and she is also part of the negotiating team. 
And she is also on Broadway right now in A Beautiful Noise. And this week, we're here to find out an update, and but also to discuss the impact of this strike on working actors and find out exactly what the emotional and financial, political, personal, and cultural effects are of not only the strike, but this whole vicious Wall Street model of streaming that seems to have been forced upon artists and has nothing to do with art or entertainment for that matter. So I'm happy to introduce Linda Powell. Hi, Linda. Hi, Jack. It's so great to be here. Thank you. Have you been on the picket lines recently? Um, I've been out since day one. We hit the ground running and I tried to hit all four picket lines that we had in New York and the international component, the number of international reporters that were out there trying to get our comments and trying to talk to us. I was on a picket line uh, yesterday, I think, that uh, had the Mexican uh, union there. Wow. to support us. And it had a French reporter there who wanted to talk to us. And the Iranian woman came towards the end of the session to, to film some of what we were doing. Not just actors, but um, every every worker around the world, I think, is uh, we've made a noise because we bring some famous faces with us and because we've shut down an industry that is known all over the world. So I think that has made an impact and makes people not just interested in what we do, but surprised to find out how much our cause is their cause. What's the mood out on the line of, of the rank and file? It, we have not been able to gather for so long, and we've just been coming just now, emerged from COVID kind of yeah. lockdowns over the spring. The, the officers were closed. We weren't having in-person membership meetings. Right now, just the, the thrill of being together with the membership, meeting people that I had not had the chance to meet in person. I have full-on best friend relationships with people that I'm realizing as I walk up to them, oh my God, I've never actually been in the same place with you. <laughs> so there's a little bit of that going on. And then also just kind of the energy of um, righteousness. Uh -huh. that we all feel that we are gathering together and that we are in a fight that we all believe in. We voted 97% for strike authorization. Wow. So um, everybody is on board and, and, I think that our leverage is really strong and our energy is strong right now. What What are your best picket line chants? There was one at Netflix the other way. Netflix, don't chill. Now's the time to pay your bills. I like it. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, great. On, on this show, we played uh, Fran Drescher's amazing speech. Could you do a summary of what the issue are for those who haven't caught it and why this is more than just the battle for money? On, on the one hand, it is a battle for money. We are we are asking for minimums and we are asking for an outsized minimum increase to deal with the rate of inflation that's happened over the past few years. They're offering us money that would keep us at 2020 rages uh, through 2026. So that's one thing that's a big issue. Um, then there's the issue of um, art artificial intelligence and the way that it's already starting to change the business and the way that we expect it will change the business in the future. Um, we know we can't stop technology, we can't stop progress, but we also know that we need fences if they're going to use our images in ways uh, that we need to consent and compensation for. Um, then there's a way that the industry has just turned completely upside down with the advent of, of the streaming model. Um, our contract that we negotiate on right now has its roots, uh, 1960, television and movies, you know, three networks, and everything has changed. I, I think with the AI also, people don't realize that there are two key issues. One is compensation, and the other is consent. In other words, I could be in a background, if I were a member of the union, <laughs> you could be in the background for, mm -hmm. I'm just going to throw something out there, for a Joe Biden commercial. And tomorrow, that same image could be used for a Donald Trump <laughs> uh, commercial. And uh, you have no consent over it. The technology that they're developing is is yeah. so sophisticated that um, consent is is a huge part of what we're fighting about because it's going to be great for them for their superhero movies they're going to be yeah. able to make the people fly and jump and boom that's not going to be so great for some of our stunt performers uh who are going to be in danger of losing work as these things get more sophisticated so it's a slippery slope there's this generative ai that term where 
they could they want to create synthetic performers or experiment with creating synthetic performers oh which are will be performers that are not don't look like anybody they're not replicating anybody but in order to create them they need our <laughs> images our library content we just want to be able to use it to do research yeah yeah your bodies and your thoughts yeah yeah and your art our, our, our art mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. You said something earlier that made me think of those, this word content. I feel like when they started calling our work content, that was the beginning of, of, of the slide down to where we are today. Um, content, that's, the, that's a word used by a technology company and it's just about how much can we fill up our bucket so that as many people as we can fit in will wanna watch something on here. And to create that content, not just the sexy AI stuff. They they change the way we work. They will budget overtime into their budgets so that they can shoot things that used to take eight to ten days in six to seven, and just build the overtime into the budget as opposed to paying people the extra days, as opposed to letting people mm -hmm. have real turnaround time and sleep. And uh, that's the way that they're keeping their costs down so that they can fill their content. Um, so. It's, yeah. it's, it's really a, a seminal moment that we have to stand firm where we are. Well, that's that's so interesting what you're saying about the uh, the word aspect of it, of content, that there's what they're doing is they're separating the art from the artist and uh, just making everything into a commodity. And even mm -hmm. the artist mm -hmm. is a commodity, a replaceable one. I think there was a, an article in the Times about the, the writers, how they were trying to break everything up into little pieces. Like the, they, they oh, yeah. explicitly said a factory model. Yeah, so that was that, a great article. Yeah, yeah. That, that was really something. Well, you know, I, there's so much to talk about this, but yeah. I, I want to get I want to get into actually your personal, you know, I want to little get a little personal, which is how does this affecting you guys from day to day, from moment to moment, trying to make a living? This is my first strike, and uh -huh. I'm feeling the love of the membership. I'm feeling the excitement of the membership. It's great. Our union has never, to me, felt as strong as it feels today. There's also, of course, the the issue of. Uh, Healthcare too, and uh, I, I imagine. Yeah, well, when I when I mentioned feel oh, being worried about the members and feeling for the pain this has caused the members, that's a, that's a question I get on the line a lot. Is like, are you going to be able to do anything so that we can still qualify for health insurance? And the hard answer is no. We're doing a really hard thing. Hmm. Um, we're doing a really hard thing here, and the way that we qualify. I mean, I'm a I'm a typical kind of quintessential New York actress. I uh -huh. cobble together my living from. Right. Some days it's a play, some days it's a commercial, some days it's theater, some days it's a podcast, and you put it all together. And I earn my health insurance by picking little things here and there and making that $26,000 um, qualification fee. Um, it They accrue over, you, you get look back periods, and people who are about to qualify are not qualifying because we stopped work. People who will be looking in six months at how much they qualified, will not qualify because we weren't working for however many months. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna throw a lot of people off health insurance and we need okay. to make sure we do whatever we can to help those people. Um, there's money in and money out. There's no contributions coming in if we're not working either. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of responsibility and the kind of grit we have to have and the kind of challenge to find creative ways to make sure that we that we can support people the best we can and and actually encourage the public to help us um because we have such well i was in, in times square the tourists will stop and say tell me tell me about this what are you talking about what are you guys doing here and then they'll say how can we help and i say give to the side after foundation give to the entertainment community fund those will be the places that that help our members and help other people who are affected by the strike which i think is a righteous work action I fell out of health insurance six months ago because I've been doing this play, so I wasn't working in TV and film. When I qualified back again, I said, let me see how I qualified. What, what? Because I has still have been mainly doing the play. I re-qualified from traditional television shows, from the reruns of traditional television shows. And I mean things like um, things that are on CBS and ABC, episodes of Madam Secretary, oh. episodes from long ago of mm -hmm. Uh, Law and Order SVU, for which I'm still getting paid. <laughs> that's how that's how the model used to work. 
that model is, is gone, that model is broken, but we still need to find a way where we participate in the, in the continued success, the continued life of a show. The uh, vertical integration of the industry. What I'm also interested in is, obviously this is a labor issue, but it's also a culture issue. How has what gets to the screen changed because of this current model? It's really Wall Street and and your stock price has become the primary metric for them. And uh, it used to be we'd negotiate across the table with Warner Brothers. We'd negotiate with people who actually made TV and understood how TV and films were made. And now there's these tech companies in the room. Uh, there's Amazon in the room. Some of these people were not even their primary business. We're just a way for them to get more people to their platform to sell books or soap or clothes or everything else that they sell. Or Apple, for instance, uh, Apple is in the room. There's so many different parties across the table from us right now that I think they have as much trouble agreeing with each other as they do agreeing with us. You can say your streaming business isn't making a profit, but we can see way up there where there's a lot of money way up there. I wanted to say one thing about that, the health insurance thing too. So many unions are having trouble with their plans and, 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 and having to make cuts. This is an American problem, this thing, and that we have to tie our health insurance to our labor and that we have to negotiate for, for, for health care at the same time as we're negotiating for basic wages is, is a travesty. And this country really, someday we are going to come to terms and really take action about how people in this country get taken care of. It's really uh, it, the humanity missing in the way that we, the struggle we put people through for basic health is, is just shameful. Uh, should we be canceling our Netflix subscriptions until things change? Should we not be going to the movie theaters? We're not asking people to do that. It, I think if this goes on longer, it's something we'll revisit. I do have friends who have done it anyway because they feel passionately that they don't want to support these companies. Mm -hmm. But it's not something that we as a union are asking of people right now. Is there a reason for that? I don't know what the reason is. <laughs> if, okay. You know, it, I think it might be more strategic if everybody does it at once. And so mm -hmm. there might come a time when that's another lever to that's pull. A, that's I, probably I, my I, guess. It's a mm -hmm. strategy thing. Okay. As we wrap up, any last words that you'd like to add in? Just thank you. Thank you for having yeah, us on. Yeah, thank you for what you're doing. Thank welcome. you for helping to amplify our message because that's what's going to keep us out there in the world and keep people um, supporting us. So appreciate you. Okay. I I did want to ask what would an AI be like, but... Uh... I'll tell you what, when they were talking about those, all the terms and all the things, I was like, I may quit acting. I don't think I want a Linda walking around doing <laughs> <It's> <laughs> really? just too weird. The conversations were like. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Linda Powell, first vice president of the New York local of the SAG after a union. This is Jack Shalom for Arts Express with host Prairie Miller. And we'll go out now on the show with Bro on the global television beat. Arts Express Paris correspondent Professor Dennis Bro on apocalyptic TV and global warming. What's up with all the glut of doomsday fear on the big and small screens lately? This is Bro on the Global Television Beat, Breaking Glass, today's episode, Twin Apocalypses. The soot from the Canadian wildfires was so thick along the East Coast that in New York and Washington, school sessions were canceled and messengers compelled to keep working resurrected N95 masks from the last apocalypse in order to breathe. Meanwhile in Europe, the floods from the sabotage of the Russian-controlled dam in the Ukraine may result in 20,000 hectares of land used to grow grain in the breadbasket of the world remaining infertile for five years. While that same act also endangered the cooling process in the Russian-controlled Zaporizhia nuclear plant, the largest in Europe. Credits and this is the title, Apocalyptic TV and Global Warming. Don't worry, be glum. Pilot, Frederick Jameson's famous dictum that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism has been taken up wholeheartedly by the makers of corporate television. In numerous series stretching across different genres and now accounting for its own genre, 
post-apocalyptic TV, broadcast, cable, and streaming TV, and of course numerous films have concocted a plethora of endings to the world as we know it, which have the effect of failing to challenge the climate apocalypse as the catastrophe calls for immediate action in the present to keep the worst from happening. In so doing, the makers of corporate TV, largely American but then picked up across the globe using the American prototypes, have found a new way forward in the persistent refusal to challenge the fossil fuel industry that is a more sophisticated approach to the now mostly discredited climate denial narrative initiated by that industry. For if the catastrophe is unavoidable, we may as well begin planning for the post-apocalyptic future. In the industry, these are referred to as dystopian series, but that's similar to calling climate destruction climate change. It's a carbon-neutral way of labeling the problem without discussing it. The show highlights the shift from apocalyptic series, which focus on the moment of the end times of the Earth and might be politically more useful, to the post-apocalyptic series, where the end and point of destruction has already come and gone, and the series is about coping with the aftermath in the best way possible. The material reasons for the preoccupation with apocalypse at this conjuncture are the destruction of the Earth, the escalating danger of nuclear war, and the decline of the West, all of which is accompanied by a resolute repression in the corporate media, which either refuses to engage or downplays the implications of any of these conditions. However, dialectically, this also allows for an opening, whereas in series based in the present, political content is mostly abandoned or repressed. These series, once the idea that the end time is not nigh, but here, may allow a freedom for both pursuing a deep critique of the contemporary order and a positing of alternative orders. Oil I want is you. Quote, the best thing about the earth is if you poke holes in it, oil and gas comes out. It's a Republican U.S. congressman. In the wake of the increasing failure to confront climate catastrophe and to rein in the fossil fuel industry, as the next global conference on climate, COP28, is being held in the oil-rich city of Dubai, chaired by the head of the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, and with calls on the Paris Left Bank to boycott the conference, depictions of the end times have increased. At this year's Series Mania, the largest television festival in the world held at Lille in France, apocalyptic and post-apocalyptic series had, along with Me Too Female Liberation series, become the dominant, accounting for 13% of the total of 55 series. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists has set the doomsday clock at 90 seconds to midnight as planetary destruction looms. This grim future reality, though, is belied by a most abundant present for oil and gas companies whose profits have never been greater. In addition, the war is occasioned to return to the most dangerous and most polluting methods of extraction, including in the West, deep water drilling and the return of coal, and across the world, new nuclear power plants announced in Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines, as France threatens to bring 6 to 14 new plants online, irregardless of the nuclear waste those plants will generate. In the U.S., now become the largest supplier of natural gas, this has meant a return and reopening of the previously unprofitable industry of fracking. In a new narrative, where this this process, which destroys drinking water and leaks methane in a way comparable to coal mining, quote, saved American democracy. The day the war began, the Bloomberg News Agency ran a story headlined, Fracking a Powerful Weapon Against Russia, trumpeting the return of an industry that had almost gone bankrupt. The carbon imprint of the replacement of Russian oil and natural gas with American fracked gas, with its increased transport distance, is two times greater than before. Add that to the imprint of American hydraulic fracking, and the carbon imprint is almost three times greater. In addition, the war has also seen the blowing up of the Nord Stream 1 and 2 Russian pipelines, with the culprit still an object of surmise, but with much of the evidence, as marshaled by the U.S. Pulitzer Prize-winning investigative journalist Seymour Hersh, leaning toward the U.S. and Norway, oil producers who have been the major benefactors of the sabotage. The methane emitted from the cloud that passed across Europe was described as the highest release of methane gas ever on the planet. All this in terms of the apocalyptic imagination leads to the acute and painful realization that, quote, our leaders are not looking after us. We are not cared for at the level of our survival. Other apocalypses. Two other forms of destruction ever more on the horizon, which also are essentially going largely undiscussed and unheeded, are the renewed threat of nuclear war in the face of the ever-escalating war in Ukraine, and what I will call Imperial malaise, the decline of the West, which is being hastened by the division of the West, and the rise in resistance with the rest of the world, prompted also by the war. 
With Russia having announced the stationing of nuclear weapons in nearby Belarus and with the NATO countries continuing the path of escalation, the British supplying depleted uranium weapons, which will leave radiation traces on both the Ukrainian users and the Russian targets while destroying swaths of the environment, the Germans sending Leopard tanks east in an ominous suggestion of World War II, and with Poland now demanding to be armed with U.S. nuclear weapons, and as the U.S. Secretary of State declares the U.S. will support no peace talks and will not end the war, the threat of a full-scale nuclear war increases daily. This threat, mostly unacknowledged in the corporate press, also feeds the feeling of hopelessness and a sense the world may be coming to an end. The failure of the West, led by the U.S. to enlist the rest of the world in its campaign against Russia, with fully 83 percent of the world refusing to go along with U.S. sanctions, has hastened an already accelerating decline as the center of economic activity shifts eastward to Asia. The results have been a cumulative apocalypse, which has seen income disparity worsen to the point where the creators of these television series, the Hollywood writers, claim as a primary reason for their strike they can no longer support themselves on their salaries, while profits within the streaming industry soar. In France, inflation from price gouging in the war, the raising of the retirement age, and the canceling of job security is expressed in a bit of graffiti on the left bank that simply states, grève ou crève, strike or die. Finally, there is the crisis of the drug epidemic as a way of coping with this destruction that has passed from heroin to Purdue Pharma distributed Oxycontin to fentanyl, seven times more potent and addictive than heroin. All three discovered and originally manufactured in big pharma laboratories, making the streets of Los Angeles unsafe. It's no wonder that one of the contemporary Hollywood apocalyptic series from has everyone locked in their homes at night with living dead, flesh-eating zombies ready to devour anyone who lets their guard down and goes outside. The full weight of these various apocalypses is never registered in the continuing onslaught of corporate media, where we are told that despite it all, the system is coping, doing its best, and is still the hope for humanity. The cognitive dissonance and distance between what is said and what the collective unconscious knows to be true, but which must remain unsaid, is also responsible for the dominance of the terrifying images of post-apocalyptic television. How can it be, for example, that a country which holds itself up as a shining beacon to the world, sometimes called the indispensable nation, supplies B-16 bombers to Ukraine at $550 million per plane, but forces its homeless in Los Angeles, epicenter of a national housing crisis, to sleep at night on public buses? Thank you, Dennis Bro. And that's all we have time for today on Arts Express, Expression in the Arts. And if you'd like to express yourself too, you can write to us at theradiogoddess at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Prairie Miller leaving the station.